Welcome to the podcast of Grace Community Bible Church. We hope and pray that you are blessed, challenged, and inspired by this message. For other sermons or more information, visit us at gracebiblechurch.org.au. I just want to thank God for uh, another opportunity to uh, be able to stand at this pulpit and to declare God's Word. And I trust and pray that today, as we look into His Word, that we would in humility be transformed by the truths that is presented to us today. And so for today, uh, without much delay, I'd like to get into the passage that we uh, read this morning. Um, I particularly will be going past a few verse, uh, previously to a few verses, and we're reading from James chapter 2, verses 14 through to 26. James chapter 2, verse 14 through to 26. It reads, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says that he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Verse 18, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Verse 20, do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on that altar? You see, that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness and, as he, and he was called a friend of God. Verse 24, you see, a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. You see, the last week we spent some time looking at the previous passage from verses 1 through to 13 of the same chapter. We saw how James addressed the sin of partiality or the sin of favoritism. And now I believe, and and in the past um, couple of um, sermons, we've also looked at James chapter 1 uh, and the different aspects of sin that James mentions there. And now if we we track this passage along and we arrive at chapter 2 in this particular passage, the main theme of the book of James is mentioned here. So faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Or as verse 26 says, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. And that is the central theme of the book of James. You see, in fact, like I mentioned earlier, chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, all the way to the end of the book, there are 51 instructions or there are 51 imperatives of what a living faith is meant to look like. Like I said last week, James is not a a treasure trove of theology or doctrine, but it is a treasure trove of direct instructions of how one ought to live. And this passage that we just read is the central theme of this entire book of James, where he's, he's culminating his entire thought into faith that results in works. And those 51 imperatives are to be used like a self-examination kit to see whether our faith is the real deal or not, if our faith really produces works or not. Last week we saw how James exposed the hypocrisy of someone who claimed to have faith but exercised partiality. And so today we will continue looking at that issue of faith and works. And I want you to take careful observation of what we are about to look at today as we dive into this passage. Now, if we look at the verses that we just read carefully, that we can, then we can observe that James is presenting his arguments in the form of a question and answer. If you look at your text in the Bible, you'll see there's a lot of question marks at the end of certain statements. Now, this is quite unusual for James to do that, because if you look at chapter 1, there isn't a lot of questions that James is throwing to his readers. In fact, if you look at it, um, James is introducing a style of argument called a diatribe. A diatribe is nothing but a rhetorical way of putting questions and answering questions to prove a point. 
And often it goes between the first person, the second person, and the third person. And so James is actually introducing a rhetorical argument to prove a point, which to me makes me believe that James is getting to the crux of his entire book, or this book of James that he's talking about here. He's reaching the crux of his argument, and he's actually really building it up. I believe James is doing that in order for us to understand the gravity of the truth that he's presenting in this passage. And if we do not understand it, if we do not obey it, if we do not follow it, then we have missed one of the most fundamental foundational truths of our Christian faith, that faith results in works. So with that that in mind, let's look at the text for today. Verse 14, he says, What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? You see, rather than beating around the bush, James is opening his argument with a direct question. If I were to paraphrase it, James is basically saying, can you have faith without works and still be saved? I I believe that in asking this question, James hits the nail on the head and addresses one of the most fundamental issues that has plagued the church since the start of Christianity. You see, the church consists of two kinds of people. They're either saved or they're not. They either have living faith or they have dead faith. They either have saving faith or they have damning faith. And so James here is posing the question that helps one determine whether the faith that we have is real or not. Whether the faith that we have is evidenced by fruits or works. And as we progress through this passage, I want to pose questions to us to really ask ourselves to see if we're in the faith or not, whether our faith is evidenced by works. And so for today, as, we, as I tackle this passage, I want to present to you four evidences of living faith. Firstly, we'll be looking at the fact that living faith produces mercy. Secondly, we will be looking at the fact that living faith is more than just a mental assent or an acknowledgement about truths. And thirdly, we will be seeing that living faith is not just about knowing the word. And fourthly, we will see that living faith is about absolute obedience. So with that in mind, let's look to the Lord in a word of prayer before we um, get into the passage. Father, we just want to thank you for this day and thank you for this morning that we can worship you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your word that is life, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the wor- your word that is Uh, oxygen to our souls, Lord, the means by which we live and we continue in life of obedience to you, Father. And so today, as we look into your word, we ask that you would give us uh, humility, you would give us purity of heart, that we may understand your word, that your spirit might reveal the truths of scripture to our hearts. We pray for myself, we ask for humility, we pray for clarity and wisdom as I present your word in the work that I have done. And so we ask these things in your name, amen. So the first aspect of living faith is that living faith produces mercy. Let's read verse 15 and 16. He, says, he gives an example here. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So faith by, So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So the kind of dead faith that James is talking about here is the person who, cl- who claims to have faith but has no mercy or compassion or love for another believer and the believer's needs. You see, this is the kind of faith that is not governed by a love for one another that we saw last week when James said, love your neighbor as yourself, the second greatest commandment. And if you look at this passage, we see James is presenting a situation where a brother or sister in that church that he was writing to was in need of daily food and clothing. And if if you look at the word poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, that was what a definition of a destitute was. In the Old Testament, a, a, a person who was a destitute was considered to be someone who had no means to provide adequate food and clothing for himself. And we see that a believer who is in, help, in need of help in the church and he possibly sought help from the congregation has received the wrong response 
from people. Verse 16, it says, And one of you says to them, Go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them things needed for the body. What good is that? Now, there are a couple of observations that I want to make about that text. Firstly, he says, Go in peace. Now, the peace referenced in this passage here is a peace that is a blessing from God, meaning that, you know, he's saying, Oh, may the peace of God be with you. And the word go indicates that they have rejected the plea of this man who is a destitute. This man who is in need has been rejected and they are asking him to leave. Pretty much they are showing him out the door and saying, may God's peace be with you. You see, the hypocrites in the church spiritualize this situation by bringing God into the picture and saying that go with God's peace while acting in absolute hypocrisy and opposition to God's word. They offered only spiritual comfort at no cost to themselves when their actual need to be met was material. I personally think that this is the biggest hypocrite of all, the one who acts and talks spiritual language without rightly loving his fellow believers, without rightly understanding the act of mercy that he needs to show towards a brother or sister in need. Secondly, this person says, be warmed and filled. You see, it exposes the fact that not only was there, a lack, was there a lack of compassion or love and mercy, but the fact that this person is cruel and evil. When he says, he basically saying, I can't feed you, I can't take care of you, um, but you take care of yourself. He says, be warmed and filled, as though the poor man didn't know how to do it himself. How heartless is that? How evil is that? He's pretty much saying, you know, hope you have enough to survive on yourself. Go with the peace of God, because I can't do anything about it. And I'm not going to do anything about it. And showing him out the door. It was his duty to care for his brother in Christ who is in need. Now, this destitute is not someone else who is an unbeliever. He's actually another fellow believer. And in fact, considering the people that James is writing to, the Jewish Christians, they of all people should have known that it is their duty to take care of orphans, widows, and destitutes. These three people groups were considered in the Old Testament as among the most vulnerable, and God in the law has ordained special care for these three people groups. And of all people, the Jewish Christians should have known that. Leviticus 19 verse 9 says, When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap the field right up to its edge, neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. Exodus 23, 10 to 11 says, For six years you shall sow your land and gather its yield, but the seventh year you shall let it rest and lie fallow that the poor of your people may eat, and whatever they leave, the beasts of the field may eat. You shall do likewise with your vineyard and with your olive orchard. You see, the Jewish Christians should have known better. And if you remember last week, we looked at verse 8 and 9 in dealing with partiality. The, the solution to dealing with partiality was to love your neighbor as yourself. A vertical love for God resulting in a horizontal love for people. And this is that same people that James is exposing here to be hypocrites. Hypocrites and, and people who have loveless faith. And that is false faith. James, I believe, here is expo exposing those who claim to have faith but show no love or mercy. James is implying that living faith should cause us to love people and to have compassion for the needs of people, spiritually, materially, and physically. In Matthew 5, 7, Christ says, Blessed are the beautiful, merciful, for they will receive mercy. In Luke 6, 36, he says, Regarding loving our enemies, he says, Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. You see, when we show love and mercy, it is a reflection of Christ. It is not just an act of charity that we do to feel good about ourselves. It is a reflection of Christ. And in the same way that the moon reflects the light of the sun, we reflect the love of Christ when we show mercy. And often, 
we will only show mercy when we realize how much mercy we've received. When we realize how much we have received from God and not received what we should have, then we will understand what it is to show mercy. We can only love unless we realize we've been loved. We can only give mercy unless we realize the mercy that we've received from God. James finishes in verse 16 and says, If one claims to have faith and at the same time does not care for in the least for the need of a fellow brother or sister, then what good is that? Do we love one another? If we love one another, is our love marked by compassion and care for one another? Or is it a love that is driven by a desire for self? In fact, do you know what the need of a fellow believer is? Are we oblivious to the suffering that's around us, be it spiritual, be it physical, be it emotional? How are we exercising the command to love our neighbor as ourselves? And is our love motivated by God, or is our love any different to the world? James, in verse 17, concludes his argument by saying that if one does not have love and compassion for his fellow brother, then that faith is a dead faith. So, the first aspect of living faith is that it produces mercy. Moving on, let's look at the second aspect of living faith. The second aspect of living faith is that it is more than a mental assent or acknowledgement. Look at verse 18. He says, but someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. You see, in this passage, James is tackling the person who has a mere mental or intellectual acknowledgement about faith but has no works to prove it, no works to back it. He's arguing against those who think that having faith is sufficient for Christian living and that works are not required. Why I think this is important is because the church since the beginning of time has had people assent and acknowledge Christianity and espouse its values, but have no evidence of God's work in their lives. Early this year, during the Belgrave Heights Convention, Ninita and I attended a, a seminar run by Murray Campbell from Menton Baptist Church. And I distinctly remember him talking about the statistics of Christians in Australia. And while commenting on the decline of Christianity in Australia, what he said is that the primary contributor to the decline of Christianity in Australia is the decline in cultural Christianity, a decline in cultural Christians. Who are these cultural Christians? You see, we belong to a country with the majority Christian population, and yet the biggest percentage of Christians in Australia fall into this category of simply ticking a box on a government form that says they're Christian either because of culture or heritage or lineage. These are the kind of people that attend church on a Christmas or Easter service, yet in their daily lives have nothing to do with Christ. You see, one of the first people I met in Australia, a great guy who was a Vietnam War veteran, who proudly proclaimed that he belonged to the Church of England, and he firmly believed that his church membership would help them to make it to heaven, regardless of the sinful lifestyle that he led. This is the kind of people that James is talking about here. Those who make an acknowledgement about faith, but have no works to prove their faith. In Matthew 15, we see Jesus exposing the hypocrisy of the Pharisees and scribes that held to a faith based on tradition. He quotes prophet Isaiah and says in Matthew 15, verse 8 and 9, This people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. The question for us is whether our faith is just a mere mental acknowledgement about Jesus Christ. Or does it go beyond that? If we were to examine our faith, would it go beyond just an acknowledgement and, and show that we have works that we produce or fruits that we produce? Does the faith that we have respond to the gospel in the same way that a dead man responds to life being given to him? Or do we have dead faith? Dead faith. 
Thirdly, living faith is not just about knowing the word. James uses another rhetorical question and argument and in verse 19 and 20 says, you believe that God is one, you do well, even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? You see, James here in this argument is exposing the hypocrisy of the so-called theologians who claim that faith stops at the knowledge of the word. You see, it is important that we understand again the crowd or the people that James is writing to. Now, if you understand that he's talking to Jewish Christians, I'd like to give a little bit of insight into the Jewish upbringing. And I think that is important in understanding this point. In his discourse on the sketches of Jewish social life, Alfred Edersheim quotes Philo and says, I quote, Having been taught the knowledge of the laws from earliest youth, they bore in their souls the image of the commandments. He's talking about Jewish children being raised up. One of the early church fathers says this, From their earliest consciousness, they had learned the laws so as to have them as it were engraven upon their souls. You see, children in Jewish culture were raised up with rigorous training in the Word of God. They were trained in the Torah, and in, that, that included intense memorization. You could take the written book away from them and they could memorize the entire scripture back to you. These are the people that were saturated with the Word of God and who had a good foundational understanding of Scripture. Yet, it stopped at that. Their understanding of Scripture enabled them to have a very orthodox form of view of Christianity, but that orthodox view did not lead to them having works or bearing fruit in their lives. It was a proud proclamation about knowing God and knowing God's Word, yet their lives were far away from obeying God. You see, James is writing to people that knew their catechisms, they knew all their theology, they knew all their doctrine, and they had a good grasp of it. Which is why I believe that James sarcastically drops the bomb in verse 19, and he says, even the demons believe. You see, now he's comparing these people that know all, all their theology and all their doctrine to demons. Even the demons believe and shudder. James is leaving no stone unturned in exposing what false faith looks like. In fact, if you think about it, the demons have done a bit better. The demons believe and they've gone one step ahead and they've said they even shudder. And when you think about the demons, who are they? The fallen angels. They were in the presence of God. They have seen God. They know about God more than anybody else. They're the best theologians. They agree with the doctrinal statement of GCBC. You know, they are the best theologians in the world. And yet, what is their response to the knowledge that they have? They shudder. They fall one step short of true faith, which is obedience. But they shudder. And these Jewish Christians don't even do that. They take pride in their knowledge and in their heritage and in their orthodoxy. And they stop at that. Which is why James is actually making a sarcastic statement when he says, even the demons believe and shudder. If the demons who have got the most accurate theology shudder, then how can one take pride in the limited knowledge that we live in? And he continues his rhetoric in verse 20. He says, do you want to be shown, you foolish person? He calls this person who has so much knowledge in his head and he thinks he's got everything right as a foolish person that faith apart from works is useless. What James is saying that if we think that we have faith because of the knowledge and the intellect that we possess, then we are foolish. You see, the foolish pride person depends on his pride of the knowledge that he possesses. His faith is dependent on the knowledge that he possesses. And his faith does not result in wax. And this is a danger, especially in a church like we are in, where we have a high view of Scripture, 
where it is easy to equate knowledge of Scripture to faith or knowledge of Scripture to maturity. But if the knowledge that we possess, the knowledge that we have does not produce fruit, then it is dead faith. If we are not living in obedience to the Scripture, to the Word of God that we proclaim from this pulpit in our Bible studies in every conversation that we bring Scripture out, if we do not live in obedience to that, then our faith is dead faith. Finally and fourthly, living faith is about absolute obedience. I believe James has now arrived at the last and the most important argument of this passage. Look at verse 21 to 25 with me. He says, Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see, that faith was active along with his works and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. And he was called a friend of God. You see, that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Verse 25, and in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? Now James here is offering insight into the deciding moments of the lives of two heroes of faith that these Jewish Christians held in high regard. Well, at least one of them they held in high regard. First Abraham and then Rahab. And through these examples, James is hoping to drive the point to these Jewish Christians that living faith results in absolute obedience, even in the most difficult and near impossible trials in our lives, as was the case with Abraham and Rahab, as we will see. In verse 21 to 23, Abraham is the, Abraham is the first hero of faith that James introduces. He says, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? Now James is bringing, uh, again coming back to the fact that James is writing this letter to the Jewish Christians, he's bringing back their memory to the account of Genesis chapter 22, where God asks Abraham to sacrifice his only son Isaac on an altar as a burnt offering. Now I'm not going to get into the details of the story, but we all know how that ended. We know, all know how God provided for the sacrifice and how Abraham was blessed as a response to his obedience. It says, he offered up his son Isaac on the altar. You know, myself being a father and I have a son, you know, I know how I would respond if God asked me to sacrifice my son on an altar. And I wouldn't have responded like Abraham would. I would have a million questions and excuses. I would bring up the best arguments that I could to say why it's not the right thing to do. If you think about it, Isaac was Abraham's only son. You see, Isaac was born after Abraham had lived for a hundred years without children because him and his wife Sarah were barren. If you look at the life of Abraham, we know from Genesis 15 verse 5 that God promised Abraham that his offsprings would be numbered as the stars of the sky. And we also know from verse 18 in the same chapter that God had promised Abraham all the land that he saw around him. God had made this big grand plan and a promise to Abraham that the world would be blessed through him. Yet, there was a problem. If the world was to be blessed through Abraham, he need to have a child. And that we know that uh, from the details of the passages, uh, later passages in the book of Genesis, that after a long time of hardship, after a long time of trial, and many things that Abraham endured, it all culminated into a miraculous conception and birth of Isaac when Abraham was 100 years old. So it was not, not just a simple act of sacrifice. There's a whole history behind this point leading up to God asking Abraham to sacrifice his son on the altar. And after all these years of Abraham waiting on God to fulfill his promise and all the hardship that Abraham endured, God is now asking him to sacrifice his only son on that altar. 
How could God do that? How could God make such great promises to Abraham and yet kill the only means by which these promises could be fulfilled? In fact, this was a defining moment because if you think about it, God is going against his own word. God on one side is saying, I'm going to bless the nations through you. And on the other side, he's saying, just kill the son that I just gave you. It doesn't make sense. It goes against the character of God as a promise-keeping God. But what did Abraham do? He says in Genesis 22 verse 3, the next verse after God asked him to sacrifice Isaac, he says, he rose early next morning and went. That's it. No questions, no thinking, no arguments. He simply obeyed God. Here was a man who was about to lose everything that he had lived his life for. It was about to vanish the moment he killed his son. Yet, yet Abraham completely obeyed God. The worst trial in his life. As MacArthur put it, that's the worst trial in scripture. To kill your own son. Yet, he completely obeyed God. Which is why James says that Abraham was justified by works. James here in verse 22 says that Abraham, our father, was justified by works. And in verse 23, he says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, before we go any further, I believe there are two questions that need to be addressed in order to avoid any confusion. Firstly, when James says Abraham, our father, was justified by works, is James saying that one becomes justified by faith plus works? And secondly, is James contradicting Apostle Paul when Apostle Paul in Romans 4 verse 2 and 3 says that if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. So is James contradicting Paul then? Are they in opposition? And I think often... Uh, this, this needs, I need to address this today because often this verse has been, or these verses, verse 22 and 24, in fact, has been misunderstood and misrepresented by many, which is why even Martin Luther, the great reformer as we know it, called the book of James that as an epistle of straw because he quite couldn't understand this passage. He couldn't reconcile the two arguments. Now, I believe that the key in resolving this conflict or resolving this issue lies in the word justified. Because if we rightly understand the usage of the word justified, we will understand that Paul and James do not stand in contradiction, but rather, as MacArthur puts it, they, put, they stand back to back against liberalism on one side and legalism on the other side. And without going into much nuances of, or details of nuances of the grammar and technical word study, I want to simply state that the word justify has two usages. The first usage is in relation to God. Paul is referring to the justification of Abraham. Paul is referring to the justification of Abraham Abraham by which God declares him as righteous and saves him. Now this is the most common use of the word justification. All of us who are in Christ, when we were saved, we were justified. We were made right with God. However, there is another use of the word justification, and that is used in different parts of Scripture, and that is used particularly in relation to man. Let me read to you a quote from Mayo and MacArthur's uh, Systematic Theology that helps us to understand the second usage of the word justification. I quote, We read in a confession of the early church, and he's quoting 1 Timothy 3.16, that Christ was manifested in the flesh and vindicated by the Spirit. Vindicated is another word for proven. Certainly, the Lord Jesus stood in no need of forensic justification of being legally declared righteous. He's talking about 1 Timothy 3.16, but rather this passage speaks of the Spirit's vindication of Christ by the many miracles he performed, as well as the ultimate vindication of proof of the resurrection in Romans 1.4. In the same way, James uses the term justified in the sense of demonstrated or proven or vindicated. That is what he means here, a demonstration of one's faith. 
So what I'm essentially saying here is that Paul and James do not contradict one another. On one hand, Paul is referring to the justification as the act of being made righteous by God, whereas James here is referring to the justification as the actions through which the authenticity of one's faith is displayed. Moving on to verse 25, and he says, And in the same way was not Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? Moving on to the second hero of faith, Rahab. The story of Rahab in the Bible reminds me of the thief on the cross. You see, Rahab, like the thief on the cross, lived an absolutely immoral life. If there was anything she brought to the table, it was her wicked lifestyle of sin as a prostitute. But in a moment of conviction, in a moment of realization of the truth, she made a choice to believe and obey God by protecting his people. Now, if you think about it, why is James talking about Rahab here? Why did he not talk about anyone else from Hebrews 1? There's lots of other heroes of faith. And I think that ends, I believe that answer lies in the kind of people that James was addressing. The kind of people that were partial. The church that was partial. The church that did not love their neighbors. The church that saw differences between rich and poor. Where discrimination was rampant. I believe that James is using this example to correct their thinking of partiality and their act of disregarding the poor. I believe that he was exposing the fact that people God called to his kingdom could be as rich and powerful and as righteous as Abraham, at the same time as vile and wicked as Rahab. But that the common result of their calling to faith was their absolute obedience to God. It didn't matter where they came from. It mattered what they do now. It mattered in their life of obedience. And that is what I believe James is driving into this point. So the final aspect of living faith is that living faith requires absolute obedience, not partial obedience, complete obedience and faith and trust in God. At the start of this passage, James posed a question in verse, um, in verse 14. He said, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says, he has faith but does not have works. He, says, he poses a question, can that faith save him? I believe that he's answered that in verse 17 and also now in verse, in verse 26 when he says, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. This aspect of being dead is also used by Paul in Ephesians 2 verse 1 when he says, that we were dead in our sins. The idea is a dead body. Unless life is given to that dead body, it cannot respond. And what he's saying is that if we claim to have faith, we claim to have received the life from God that is saving faith, and our body does not respond, and there's a good chance that body is still dead. Dear church, as we conclude today, it is essential that we realize that James has presented to us a serious set of litmus tests by which we had to examine our lives. 2 Corinthians 13 verse 3 um, reads like this, Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. And this is quite serious. This is really important because in Matthew 7 verse 21 to 23, Jesus says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. What's most scary about this passage is that the people who is being condemned here are people who genuinely believed that they were in the faith. There were people who genuinely believed that they were on their way to heaven. They casted demons. They did a lot of mighty works in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. But that amounted to nothing because they didn't know Christ. Their works, their life of obedience was not reflective of the transforming, transformation of the gospel in their hearts. Faith that does not show mercy is dead faith. Faith that simply acknowledges Christ is a dead faith. 
faith that is reliant only on knowledge of theology is a dead faith. And faith that is void of obedience is dead faith. Is our faith a dead faith or a living faith? Is our faith a damning faith or a saving faith? You see, our faith is not determined by a moment of epiphany when we suddenly made a decision to follow Christ and said the sinner's prayer or got baptized in church. True living faith is only evidenced by a lifestyle of obedience to Christ and his word. Let's pray.